Next, the prolific writer who devoted her life to the fight for equality. Then, an early female architect makes waves. And later, the first visiting nurse association in Ohio. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It has been 100 years since Congress passed and ratified the 19th Amendment, giving most women across the nation the ability to vote. This show is all about celebrating a few of those women in Central Ohio who have made an impact in local and national issues. Our first story is about a prolific writer who was an abolitionist and suffragist. She devoted her life to fighting for equality through her writing and speeches. This is her story. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She was born in 1825 in Baltimore, Maryland. She was a person of color. Her parents are free, so she's born free. Unfortunately, her parents pass away, and so at age three, her uncle, William, and her Aunt Harrietta uh, take her in. He has a school, he's built a school, and he's teaching um, free colored children how to read and write, and so uh, Frances is one of his students. As she gets older, at around age 13, she works in a very well-to-do white family home as a domestic, and they have a huge library. And she is allowed to read just about everything that they have. She loves to write, and she has published her first book of poetry by the time she's 20. She comes to Ohio, and she's teaching at the Union Seminary, and she's teaching sewing and embroidery. She's writing, she's starting to lecture about all sorts of causes, the plight of slaves. Remember slavery's cruel hands, make heathens at your doors. And so she goes on the public circuit. She travels in the South, she travels all through the East Coast, she travels in New England, and then she winds up again in Ohio. In 1858, she is speaking to the Colored Men's Association. I think this is where she finally meets her husband-to-be. His name was Fenton Harper. He's a widower, and he has three children. And so for her to leave her speaking engagements and her writing, she's publishing books, she turns a lot of money over to all of these benevolent causes, but she gets married and she uh, helps her husband buy a farm outside of Columbus near Grove City. She's taking care of his three children and they have a child of their own, Mary. But uh, she's not married long because four years later he passes away. Shortly afterwards, five months later or so, she's back on the speaking circuit again, still giving money to the anti-slavery societies. She is campaigning about temperance. She's speaking now at conventions about education. You know, the war's over. They're even traveling back to the South, talking to slaves that have now gotten their freedom, but still are living there in shacks and she really talks to the women, and she has private meetings with these women on how to elevate themselves. 
I find it extraordinary in 1871 that she's going to the South, you know, when we know that the Klan has started to rise, yeah. you know, and no one ever bothers her. She sounds fearless. She is she fearless. She probably projected that. She died on February the 20th, 1911. Oh, she lived a long time. She lived a long time. She lived to be 85 years old. Crime has no sex, and yet today, I wear the brand of shame. I think she still has a profound impact, although her name may not be as much a household word, because I think what always made, impressed me about her was that uh, she really could call it out about men. She wrote a poem about the double standard, and the double standard has to be the most eye-opening poem you've ever read. How men had defined the sphere for women and that what was the difference between a woman who had fallen and a young man who had caused the fall. Women not being raised and elevated to the level of men, that would trouble her and, and she was just so adamant about trying to make a difference in all these lives. Next, one of the first female architects in Ohio begins her career at The Ohio State University, and then a nursing association's evolution into Life Care Alliance. Women wore many different hats in history before they were able to vote. They were not only wives and mothers, but they also created and served in organizations that stood up against social injustice. In the case of this next woman, the list of roles she played in Central Ohio and across the nation seemed to be limitless, and she performed those roles at the highest level, as evidenced by her design of Oxley Hall, which was the first female dormitory at The Ohio State University. Here's her story. Florence Kenyon Hayden Rector, or Kenyon Hayden Rector, as she often referred to herself, was one of Ohio's pioneer architects and part of that first generation of women practicing architecture in the late 19th, early 20th century. She was one of three women who were enrolled at the Ohio State University School of Architecture in 1901, and that was shortly after the program was established. There were a lot of women artists. There weren't as many women architects because a lot of people really didn't think women could do the engineering or understand the complexity of building and, and structures and actually to get something built. So I think all of those things, she clearly was talented. She never finished architecture school. She never had a degree, and yet she had enough ability to actually design buildings and see them built. Well, Oxley Hall, originally known as the Women's Dormitory, this was Kenyon Hayden Rector's first major commission, and she was only 24 years old. She was recommended by Joseph Bradford, who was the university architect at the time, who was familiar with her work. She submitted plans, the Board of Trustees approved her preliminary plans, but they stipulated that she should work with a male architect and that was Wilbur T. Mills, who is most famously known as the architect of the Columbus Main Library on Grant Street. Basically, it was a marriage of convenience. It wasn't something that she wanted or felt that she needed. As she recalls in an interview later in her life, she had become very frustrated working with Mills on finishing up some plans. And actually, her day books support this information. She often had to meet with the Board of Trustees or the building committee by herself because Mills was out of town or Mills was not available or not present. And then on June 30th, 1907, her day book entry is spent all day correcting Mills specs. The next day's entry says fight with Mills. In the morning. We've got to do this in the no, morning. we need to do it tonight, but what should I do tonight? Think about it. At the end of the entry, it just says, dead. <laughs> she was frustrated by having that supervision and the idea that she couldn't design this building on her own. And at one point, she actually locked Mills out of her office so she could continue to work and get the design done. Hayden. 
I think it says to me that she didn't just settle, she could do it better than the men. I'm impressed by a woman of that age, at that period of time, being able to design a building at Ohio State. So the plans were approved in August of 1907. The building opened in 1908 and was the first residence hall for women on the OSU campus. She was the only woman architect working in Columbus in the early 20th century, and many of her projects were residences, houses. She designed houses on East Broad Street, on Hawthorne Park. She was commissioned to do a bungalow at Buckeye Lake for Robert Wolf, who's affiliated with the Ohio State Journal and Columbus Dispatch. When she married James Rector, who was a local physician, she designed his medical building. And this building, sadly, is no longer standing. It was at the corner of State and Sixth Street, but it was considered really a model in efficiency in medical office designs. I think she was a modern woman, and her designs look very 20th century, even though they were designed in the early 20th century. It was a period of time when people were starting to think of homes as domestic science. It was when women became the people who managed homes, complicated homes. And I think her homes reflect that knowledge and that personal knowledge as a woman, a mother, a wife, and an architect. She was involved, along with her sister, Gillette, in the modern suffragette movement. They were both involved in the national women's movement and the idea of getting the 19th Amendment to the Constitution passed to give women the vote. In 1920, she wrote a publication called Women Awake, recounting the history of the women's suffragette movement and then putting out a final call to action for women to still step up to the plate and make sure that the 19th century amendment was actually ratified. Throughout her life was very committed to several causes, not just the suffragette movement, children's issues, prison reform, and improving women's working conditions. I think she'd easily still be a role model today. She made history happen. She broke down barriers in a male-dominated profession of architecture, and she was very passionate about a number of early 20th century reform issues. So, <laughs> what a woman! <laughs>
This is so nice. I didn't expect a real restaurant. Yes, it is because we want our clientele to get something a little nicer once in a while. So it's nicer for the clients to come, be able yeah. to socialize in addition to just having meals on wheels in their home. This looks delicious. I can't wait to dig into it. Good, me neither. Let's go. I was amazed to find out what a long, long history this organization has in the community. Well, we started in 1898. Carrie, Catherine Nelson Black, who went by Carrie, hence Carrie's Cafe, mm -hmm. and a couple of her friends took trains to Chicago and Philadelphia to look at a new concept called a district nursing office. And there were no health departments in those days. In fact, we were the health department in Central Ohio until 1950. But they went and said, we need to have a district nursing office here in Columbus in order to service people with health issues in their own home, keep them in their own home, and out of the hospital. Because the hospitals in 1898, they were full. And people were going there for a cold. So we were trying to help them with things in their home that could be handled in the home. What were the conditions like back then? How were people living and why were so many people getting sick? The conditions were not as good as you can imagine. The sanitation was not as good. Milk wasn't being pasteurized like it is today. Food wasn't kept under temperature control like we do today. So there were a lot of issues in the community and there just weren't a lot of ways to fix them. So our nurses would go out from house to house and actually service people who were in need. They didn't know how to deal with certain diseases, for example, tuberculosis, which was rampant in those days, what you did about that. And people just weren't educated and they just didn't have access to health care. Let's face facts. Seeing the pictures of women who are nursing, mm -hmm. uh, nurses taking care of babies, taking care of old people, that's really admirable, but that was not the general practice of the day. Things yeah. were segregated, yes. immigrants were looked down on, yes. um, people were forced to live in the worst parts of yes. the city, yes. and yet these women went into those very homes. Yes, we've done a lot of study on this, and I can tell you the African American population was really sequestered kind of in three streets on the west side. Well, obviously, the conditions were not quite as good as some other parts of town, the wealthier parts of town, and they didn't have access to the health care and the other opportunities other people did so that's what our group was trying to do was give them the opportunity for all the new immigrants who were flooding into the United States and Columbus Ohio at that time. Did they work with the settlement houses? Absolutely. The settlement houses would get people in town, get them going, might have a food pantry for them and then our group would provide the nursing services, the teaching, the training, the health care that they needed and between everybody's efforts they they survived and thrived. Baby camp. Mm -hmm. What was that? Well, the Columbus Baby Camp was founded back in 1908 because the infant mortality rate at that time was 150 deaths per thousand, 15 percent. And what it was was really the first daycare. It was not an orphanage. And people would either drop their baby off in the morning, pick it up at night, or they'd drop the baby off on Monday morning and pick it up Saturday night because people used to work six days a week in the breweries and in the buggy works and in the other manufacturing facilities and things like that. They would make sure they got plenty of fresh air, quality milk, which was a key thing that not everybody had. And we ended up closing the Columbus Baby Camp in 1932 because they had lowered that infant mortality rate from 150 deaths per thousand to five deaths per thousand. So how did people pay for these services? Well, for the most of our history, most of the services are provided at no charge. They are provided to people who are most in need, oftentimes poor, although anybody today can have our services. And in those days, too, in 1898, anybody could have the services. They would just ask the wealthier people to help pay for them. And in the first minutes book, I want to tell you, Catherine Nelson Black was quoted in that book as she founded us to take care of those nobody else pays any attention to. And that was very true back then, and it's still true today. But it did not remain the IDNA. Around 1950, the government said, we're supposed to have a government health department. So they broke off what is traditional now, the health department, and we kept doing what we were doing. Uh, about 45 years ago, uh, the Older Americans Act came in under President Johnson, 
And that said that if we could keep seniors and, and medically challenged individuals independent and in their own home, we save tremendous amount of tax dollars. So that started the Meals on Wheels program and we were the second city in the country to take on the Meals on Wheels program. And today, we're the largest independent charity provider of Meals on Wheels in the United States. We've taken on the Columbus Cancer Clinic that Carrie also founded. Uh, we've taken on Project Open Hand as a merger partner, which is the big AIDS nutrition program in town. Last year, we took clients from 40 counties. Oh my goodness, I'm just so impressed with that. And with my lunch. Thank you so much, Chuck. This has been terrific. Thank you for coming, Charlene. Our grandmother started this flower shop 75 years ago in rural South Carolina on Long Street. So it's quite interesting that it would become full circle here we are on Long Street in Columbus, Ohio. We have always had the flower shop. My mother has always had the flower shop. We had just at one point gone off to do our individual careers only to come back to our first love, which was the flower shop. Uh, we sat down and had a long conversation and say, well, you know, this is what we do. Um, this is what we know. We've grown up in the business. All of us have grown up in the business. We've got all of our resources in place. Resources meaning all of our vendors. Um, and in fact, some of the same vendors that we used in South Carolina for as long as I've been in the business 48 plus years ago, um, we're still using some of those same vendors. Shana would deliver flowers for me Every Sunday morning, she had passed through this building for 15 years and hadn't seen this building. And one morning, she was delivering flowers. She looked up and saw the building. She said, where in the world did that building come from? And the building been here 100 years, you know. <laughs> so she came home and she said, Mom, she said, you know what? I think I find our building. She said, I'm going to find out who, who, who owned the building and I'm gonna take you to see it. When I saw it, I said, like, ain't no way in the world. <laughs> she wouldn't come past the door. She I stood said, to the door and we came in with the owner of the building. She said, no, I'm okay, I'll stand right here. Spider met me <laughs> coming down in the doorway. <laughs> she said, absolutely not, I'm, you go ahead. <laughs> I said, ain't no way. And Shana said, well, well I see the potentials. I said, okay. <laughs> you, you showed me. It was really, it was truly a mess. Uh, the floors were pitted. There was uh, mold up the wall. There was water leaks. It had, you had to have a vision in order to see where it could possibly be. And um, lo and behold, it took us two and a half years to do the renovations. We didn't ask for a loan or a grant. Everything that we have funded, we're thankful to God that it's been a cash-based business. That's one of the things that both sets of grandparents taught us. They paid cash for their houses and their cars and um, the kids' education even at that time. And I kind of figured when we sat down and talked, if there's probability in what they're, they're saying to, to operate on a cash-based business, there's got to be some, some wisdom in that. We've been fortunate where the money that we're making, we're turning in the business. The Tisla LaFleur Galleria is not just a regular flower shop. We are a gallery of art from a floral perspective. So each piece kind of morphs into a, a piece of artwork. Someone told me, she said, a girlfriend of mine got one of your arrangements and I looked at it and I knew that it came from your shop. So it's a, it's a part about trying to stay true and grow that brand. One of the things that we've been very, very, very keen to is just whoever it is, just kind of understand what their personality is and pulling that in and pulling textures of flowers that will speak to that particular personality. And one of the things that we have also asked, um, what's your budget? What do you want to spend today? And we've got one of our neighbors um, and she will come in and spend $3 every week on something different, something pretty just for her bedside. And then we have customers that will say, Sean, you know, I only have 20. Absolutely, we're gonna fit whatever that budget is and make it beautiful. So it's, it's a combination of not running a business on a regular cookie cutter 
type situation. So we've kind of stayed away from that and making every design that's super distinctive. I knew they were gonna do it at some point. It makes me feel real, really proud of them. And, you know, I knew they was gonna do it at some point because I think maybe they're just, just, they're just like I am. They believe in working for, you know, themselves and, and carrying the legacy on. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you, thank you.